Michael Bindenbauer, CEO of TAE Technologies. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for being with us yet again, because we wanted to bring you on uh, after this major announcement today. It's official. Uh, you had officials at the Livermore Lab there, uh, the Department of Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm making this announcement. Uh, so where do we go from here? Yeah, so I mean, it was actually the numbers were better than they had initially shared with us. Uh, they, they came out that they produced uh, considerably more energy, actually about 150 percent um, compared to the sort of 120 percent that uh, we were, were made to, to believe before. So that's really good news. So, yeah, I think the, 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 uh, your little feature that you just ran says it all, right? This is a major step for humanity in the right direction. For our field, it's an inflection point. It gets us um, into that zone where we have a much higher degree of confidence that, that we're really scaling there. You know, a friend of mine and I were talking this morning, and it was sort of like when the first human, uh, you know, broke the four-minute uh, mile mark, running the mile. Before that, people weren't sure if anatomically humans can do that. Once that happens, very quickly others did as well, right? And so I think what you're seeing here is a is a, is a momentum builder, an emotional uplifting um, thing for all of us in the field. And, you know, it's technically very transformative. Yeah. Um, okay, well, as you know, uh, all, you know, scientific experiment is based on replicability. Um, will this be easy to replicate going forward? Uh, we know there's a lot uh, that goes into it. Uh, for you know a very very short amount of time with a lot of amount of energy uh, so it takes some time how easy is that going to be yeah so that's a great question and you're absolutely right we have to be able to reproduce that and not just once we have to do it reliably right once we program these conditions we should be able to reproduce them uh, on a given shot we we choose to do so that's going to take a little bit of time obviously uh, just put in perspective the NIF had about a year it goes in August last year a, a shot that got to about 70% of what they call break even, which is, you know, more energy coming out than energy going in. And uh, that gives you sort of a time frame. It took them about a year to improve to this level. Now, to be fair, this also does weapon studies and other things. So the amount of time they spend on, on energy generation or energy generation related research is limited. So I don't know exactly what their schedule is, but I'm absolutely certain they will again. There is an existence proof here now that this is possible. And of course, they don't have a very high shot pace. They fire typically once or twice a day, and then you have some repairs and things. So I, I, my, my guess would be it will take a little bit um, to, to do that again. But I'm absolutely certain the team is just waiting for the moment to show that they can not just recover that, but perhaps do a little better even. Yeah. Uh, what about, I guess, the you know wide dissemination uh, of you know how they did it, the technology that goes into it, kind of, you know, having other contemporaries, colleagues read their notes so they can replicate it. Is that operative? Is that on the table? Is that how these things work? Or do they keep that information uh, pretty close to their chest? So they're going to publish, obviously, the scientific results. The exact methodology and how it's done, to a degree, it's known. Uh, this has been in the making for a while, right? So the NIF started operating this is about 12 years ago or so, and it's been a while that they're operating. And so there's quite a bit of known, but remember also it, it, it's run by the NNSA, so it has a stockpile stewardship purpose, which is a defense purpose, right, which is classified essentially. So access to people on the outside is very limited, uh, but we do have access to some of the data that comes out that they share, which is the scientific part of it. So I, I would say it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of um, sharing. Uh, but clearly, people will see a peer-reviewed paper come on this. And uh, for the rest of us in the field, we typically do share. We share the way we uh, you know, achieve results more, more coarsely than we do the actual results. But, but there is sharing and there's learning. And in fact, um, there are things here that I'm sure colleagues that work on similar themes, both in the private sector and other public laboratories across the world, they, they will share elements of the physics, the underlying physics, the principles of, you know, and how we, you know, confront instabilities in these systems and, and timing and those kinds of things. But I think the details of some of the technical refined things are, are more or less classified. Okay. And, and, you know, Michael, let's just kind of revisit our conversation from, from yesterday when you were, uh, in layman's terms, trying to explain to us and doing a pretty good job uh, of what exactly they achieved. You're, you're essentially harnessing the sun's power uh, in an environment, though, here on Earth. Walk us through that yet again, maybe for some of the viewers who, who weren't watching last night. What was accomplished? 
Right. So as you just said, so fusion is what powers the stars, right? That gives us energy for life too. It comes from the sun. The sun is essentially a big fusion reactor in the sky. And there we do that with a lot of gravity assisting. It's massive balls of material. They gravitationally pull together and then fusion occurs, which is turning light atoms into slightly heavier atoms. And by Einstein's famous formula, it releases a lot of energy. Now, terrestrially, we can't quite utilize gravity. We have to use other means, the lasers at Livermore. And in the, in the work that I do, for instance, we work with the magnetic uh, means, magnets that confine this material. And what happened here is, and what we've been chasing for decades now, is, is the event where the energy we have to feed to make that hot state, to put this in perspective for viewers, in order to get fusion terrestrially, you need about 100 million degrees Celsius, okay? So this is not... This is not cool. This is super, super hot. And in order to get to that, you have to put a lot of heat in and energy in. And that energy is consumed in the process and it turns this thing hot and then it begins to fuse. And in this case here for the first time, uh, the, the energy we fed in was exceeded by the energy that came out. So in other words, we got more energy out than we put into the process. Um, and that's a sort of mile marker in, as an accomplishment. It says that fusion can make net energy. And so from here on the journey, of course, this taking this science proof into robust application and meaning building ultimately power plants with it. Yeah, it is quite something. We're going to hear now, though, uh, from officials announcing this. Michael Bindenbauer, we appreciate your time, your insight, helping us make sense uh, of this really, really exciting breakthrough. Uh, and have a good night. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for having us again. Appreciate it.